Today on the VVOLT channel, I'll be starting yet another new series. This being the Pokemon Adventures Arcs Explained. What I aim to cover in this series is a brief but also in-depth look at every arc in the Pokemon Adventures manga. To act as a sort of recap for those who have read it, but also a brief summary for those who haven't. And where else better to start than the first arc itself? The red, green and blue arc. So with enough waffle, let's begin. Before we get into things, I want to give a quick disclaimer. This video is not a substitute for the original source and make sure you go purchase the manga as it's a really great read. You can easily get it physically from Amazon, digitally from Amazon or on Viz. But with the disclaimer done, let's get back into things. Our story follows the main character Red, an 11 year old boy who's currently demonstrating to a bunch of kids how to catch Pokemon. By his side, he's aided by his trusty partner, Polly the Poliwhirl. The kids are all impressed by Red and his overwhelming strength, and Red tells him that his goal is to catch every single Pokemon in the world. The children of the town ask Red if he's ever heard of Professor Oak, which Red has, but he doesn't know much about him. The children explain that he knows a lot about Pokemon and taught his grandson how to become one of the world's greatest trainers. Red, however, doesn't seem to mind since he believes that no one stands a chance against him, really showing off his shonen protagonist energy. On his way home, Red bumps into a group of men in black, roaming the town. He eavesdrops on their conversation, learning that they're searching for a Pokemon known as the Phantom Pokemon, which piques his interest. And so, Red heads into the tall grass in order to find this Pokemon before they can. And after a while, Red stumbles upon a battle taking place, being a boy his age and a Charmander fighting against the mysterious glowing Pokemon. The boy orders his Pokemon to return, causing Red to jump out from the bushes and ask why he forfeited the match, with the boy not replying, instead giving him an unamused look. With the boy forfeiting, now it's Red's turn. He sends out Polly to do battle, but it gets defeated with minimal effort, and the Pokemon flees. Red is in complete shock at his defeat, and the boy lectures Red, telling him that he forfeited the match because of a difference in strength between his Pokemon and the wild Pokemon, giving Red some advice to know his limits, before walking away smugly. Overwhelmed by his defeat, Red decides that it's time to go to Professor Oak's lab in order to get some real lessons on how to become a great Pokemon trainer. Once at the lab, Red rings the doorbell, but to no answer. When he checks the handle, he realizes that the door is open, so he lets himself in, as you do in Pokemon. Inside, Red sees a ton of Pokemon inside their Pokeballs, some of which he's never seen before. One Pokemon in particular catches Red's interest, being a Bulbasaur that's kept on a table all by itself. When he tries to introduce Polly to the Pokemon, it begins to start growling. Suddenly, a door opens and Oak makes his appearance, assuming Red to be a Pokemon thief. In the panic, Red stumbles back and accidentally releases all the Pokemon from their Pokeballs, forcing Red to try to get them all back. After a long time, Red manages to catch most of them, but some of them manage to escape. Red really wants to go out and hunt for them, but Professor Oak isn't going to let him go so easily, still thinking that he's a thief. Red then explains that he wasn't trying to cause any trouble, and he's sorry for entering the lab without permission, but right now they need to focus on catching the Pokemon that went missing. And so the duo head outside, making their way all the way to Viridian City in order to catch the Pokemon, until only one remains, being Bulbasaur. When it spots Red and Oak, it immediately hides in the city's gym. Professor Oak tries to reason with the Pokemon, but it attacks him, causing Red to have to intervene and calm the Pokemon down, realizing that it's so aggressive because this is its first time outside and seeing other creatures, due to the fact that Professor Oak kept it a ball by itself, allowing Bulbasaur to calm down and trust Red. But the trio is interrupted by the appearance of a wild Machoke that wants to fight them. Bulbasaur stops the Pokemon from attacking Red, but Professor Oak gets knocked out, leaving the battle up to Red to fight himself. Although he knows nothing about the Pokemon, he uses some quick thinking to realize Bulbasaur's attack is Solar Beam, simply due to the bulb on its back. Professor Oak wakes up and is impressed by Red's actions, awarding the boy the Bulbasaur to keep, which Red nicknames Saw. Red then explains to Professor Oak everything that happened and why he sought out for him in the first place. After catching up on the story, Professor Oak then quizzes Red on what he truly believes makes a great trainer, before revealing to him the answer. What's inside your heart and the connection between trainer and Pokemon, like what Red showed with his Bulbasaur. After this lesson, Oak gives Red a Pokedex and tells him by the time that he's completed it, chances are he'd already have become a great trainer, altering Red's goal from wanting to catch them all to becoming one of the greats. A day or so later, Red heads for the Viridian Forest in order to catch more Pokemon. Also in the forest at the same time is the boy from before, who's patiently waiting for something, taking out a Pokedex and revealing himself to also be a Pokedex holder. Inside the forest, Red's Poliwhirl ends up getting attacked by a Charmander, belonging to the boy. The boy claims that he thought it was a wild Pokemon and says it was nothing personal, 
but the hothead Red gets straight to throwing hands. The boy catches his fist with ease and the two trainers then recognize each other. But they get interrupted by a stomping sound, confusing Red but exciting the boy, who's been patiently waiting for this. This being a Kangaskhan, something that doesn't even exist in the Viridian Forest. But anyway, the boy attacks a Pokemon in order to catch it, whilst taking out his Pokedex. Surprising Red to see another Pokedex in existence. The boy laughs, saying that his granddad told him that he gave away a Pokedex to someone, never expecting it to be him, also revealing himself to be the aforementioned Professor Oak's grandson. The boy then continues his attacks on Kangaskhan, but Red realizes that something's wrong when the Pokemon doesn't fight back, but instead rejects being captured. And after taking a closer look, Red tells the boy to stop attacking, but he ignores him, forcing Red to use Polly to stop the Charmander. Red runs over to the Pokemon and asks if his baby's alright, with the baby Kangaskhan poking his head out from the pouch and revealing that it's been poisoned by another Pokemon. However, this is nothing a quick antidote can't fix, as Red heals up the Pokemon good as new, allowing the Kangaskhan to return back to the wild. The boy sarcastically thanks Red, and Red advises him that a win isn't really a win if his opponent was already disadvantaged. The boy then begins to get back on his way, but not before being nagged by Red to tell him his name, which is Blue, or Green depending on the translation. And Red takes the chance to proclaim Blue as his rival, saying that he won't lose to him. And Professor Oak, who was hiding in the bushes, smiles, looking forward to seeing how the rivalry will unfold between both trainers. The next stop on Red's trip is Pewter City, where the town folk are in disarray, since the wild Pikachu has been going around and causing mayhem. So now it's time for the hero to do hero things, and Red steps in to capture the Pokemon, using Saw's Sleep Powder attack to make the Pokemon drowsy and finishing off with a simple Pokeball, making Red's third team member, Pika the Pikachu. Red gets a reward of tons of food for helping the villagers, but Pikachu isn't too happy about everything, shaking inside of his Pokeball, meaning now it's time for some attitude training. Red does his best to befriend the Pikachu, but to no success, which is picked up on by his new rival, Blue, who taunts Red on his lack of progress. Red, of course, falls for this taunt and challenges Blue to a battle, who instead comes up with a better idea, being that they should both challenge Brock of the Pewter City gym and have the winner be decided by who can get the Border Badge first. Because Red's a complete rookie, Blue explains to him the role of gym leaders, telling him that gym leaders own gym badges which can boost the power of your Pokemon. Now with a concrete goal in mind, Red decides now would be a good time to get his Pokemon healed, which turns out to be impossible as the Pokemon Center has become the victim of a vandalism attack, meaning Red's only Pokemon at full power is his Pikachu. The day of the gym challenge comes round and Red makes his way to the gym. Once he arrives, he sees Blue racking up wins against other trainers inside. But now it's Red's turn to get through the preliminaries and earn the right to fight against Brock. But because Pikachu still won't listen to him, his only choice is to fight every battle and win with one attack, going through battle after battle and gaining the attention of Brock himself. And after a gauntlet of trainers, now's the time for Red to finally fight the guy, being forced to use Pikachu as Sora and Polly have reached their limits. In the battle, Pikachu still refuses to listen to Red, but still avoids Brock's attacks for his own sake, until one stray rock hits him in the head, making the Pokemon angry, but not at the opposing Pokemon, but instead at Red, shocking him and chasing him around the ring. Brock gets annoyed as he was looking for a challenge and commands his Onyx to finish Pikachu off. But Red leaps at Pikachu at the last second to save it from danger, telling the Pokemon that he's glad it's safe and apologizes for forcing him to fight. This resonates with the Pikachu, making it attack the Onyx at full power, taking it down. In the anime, at least they tried to give Pikachu a reason for being able to defeat Onyx, but here they just said screw it. Make Red Pikachu able to attack ground types. Keep that in mind, because it's going to be a trend. That aside, that attack grants Red the victory and the Boulder Badge. Blue also managed to get the badge and most likely got it first, making him the winner of this challenge. But that stuff doesn't really matter, as Red now has a new friend in Pikachu, who he introduces to the rest of the team. Red's next journey has him running into an injured girl fighting a Gyarados. Red subs in and helps the girl in restraining and catching the Pokemon, and he's surprised to see a Gyarados in the wild. But the girl tells him that the Pokemon wasn't wild, instead it's her own Pokemon that got stolen from her and has been going rogue until now. Red gets enraged at the fourth Pokemon being stolen and wants to go put these thieves in their place, but he has no idea where they are. He then thinks that Professor Oak might have an idea about it, so he and the girl head to a Pokemon Center and contact Oak, learning that the thieves are known as Team Rocket and have been stealing Pokemon and conducting experiments on them. Oak also tells Red about the Moonstone, hidden in Mount Moon, rumored to be able to boost the power of a Pokemon enormously, and Team Rocket themselves might even be searching for that stone. So with some new intel, Red and the girl, who we learn is called Misty, make an alliance once again to find Team Rocket and the Moonstone, and surprise surprise, Mount Moon. Outside the cave's entrance, sure enough, a Team Rocket, so Red and Misty have to sneak inside to begin their search, using Pikachu's flash as a light source. 
Inside the cave, Red bumps into Team Rocket, meaning it's now time for a battle. Although he has type disadvantage, Pikachu manages to force Team Rocket's Raihan onto his back foot, making Team Rocket reveal their secret weapon, a syringe that they inject into Raihan, causing it to evolve into Rhydon. Misty tries to help with Staryu, but Rhydon's too powerful and knocks them both out, leaving Red and Pikachu the only ones left standing, but even they struggle to fight back against it. So knowing that he can't win, Red gets Pikachu to cause a cave-in, separating the two sides and allowing him and Misty to escape the mountain. Misty's sad that they failed to get the Moonstone, but Red reveals that under the rocks that fell lied the Moonstone, meaning mission half complete. As thanks for his help, Misty takes Red to her mansion in Cerulean City, and she gets her maids to clean his clothes and heal his Pokemon. Later in the evening at the dinner table, Red brags to the maids about his power in defeating Team Rocket, but Misty tells him that after that encounter, the two should train seriously. Red, however, believes he doesn't need any training, claiming now he knows how to handle Team Rocket, causing the two of them to get into an argument and Misty storming off. Later at night, Red's in his room with his Pokemon, when suddenly he gets attacked by a heavy gust of wind, spinning everything around. After a while, the gust of wind stops and on the floor lies a single Gyarados scale. The next morning, Red tries to think who could have attacked him, when the maids all come in wanting to see him in action, with Red saying he can show off to them against the city's gym leader, which makes all the maids start to laugh. Just then, Misty appears, offering to take Red to the gym herself, so he takes her up on the offer, and once inside the gym, she reveals herself as the city's gym leader. At first, Red doesn't believe her, but after an attack from Starmie, he has no choice. Red tries to fight back with Bulbasaur, but they get washed away by Bubble Beam. Red asks Misty what's going into her, and she explodes, telling Red that the two of them should have been a team who worked together to get stronger and defeat Team Rocket. Making Red realize he was wrong, and Misty was right. He shouldn't be trying to impress girls, instead he should be training. And after a few days of said training, Red says his goodbyes to Misty with a new gym badge under his ownership. After the events with Misty, Red finds himself running into Bill, who accidentally fused himself with a Rattata. Bill then gets swooped up by a Fero, forcing Red and his team to help him out. After defeating and catching the Fero, Red helps Bill turn back to normal, and Bill gives him access to the Pokemon Transporter system, allowing him to switch his team around with no issues. The next stop on Red's adventure takes him to Vermilion City, where he spots the massive SS Anne, and gets a little too curious about it, sneaking onto the ship before getting scared by a shadowy figure inside, causing him to get caught by the ship's crew and thrown off the ship. Red then gets approached by the Pokemon fan club's chairman, who after seeing Red's Pokemon, makes him an honorary member of the Pokemon fan club, bringing him to their main building. Once there, Red learns about the Pokemon fan club and its members, and has his Pokemon shown off to them, with one lady asking Red how long he's had Poliwhirl. Red explains that he's had Polly since he was a little kid, and Poliwhirl was just a Poliwag. Suddenly, a man enters, claiming that someone has stolen his executor, which leads to Red finding out the multiple cases of Pokemon getting stolen, meaning now it's time for more hero stuff. Red asks about everything he can on the case, with the people telling him that the abductions all happen around the same time every month, with Red coming to the conclusion that the thieves must be transporting the Pokemon fully sized, as getting the Pokeballs from the owners would be too difficult, and the only thing able to do that would be something big itself, which causes Red to ask about the SS Anne, the people tell Red that the city's gym leader has been using it to transport supplies to Cinnabar Island, in other words, Pokemon. So with this new piece of information, Red heads to the SSN, but not before having to leave Pikachu behind with the chairman, so that he can cuddle it. In order to get on the ship successfully, Red gets Bulbasaur to lift him up from the side, and has it wait for his return whilst he and Polly go onto the ship. Red finds the room that initially had the shadowy figure he saw before, and this time finds nothing but a Pokeball, that turns out to actually be a Voltorb. He and Polly manage to chase it away, but Poliwhirl ends up passing out due to getting electrocuted by an unknown attacker. The attacker reveals himself to Red to be Lieutenant Surge, the one in charge of the SS Anne and all the Pokemon on board. Red tells him he's going to stop him and the thieves, and Surge replies saying that they're not thieves. Instead, they're saving the poor Pokemon from being pampered and unevolved. Although Red's angry, he knows there's not much he can do with only one Pokemon by his side, especially now that Lieutenant Surge is bringing out his secret weapon, Electabuzz. Red barely dodges its attack, but with the use of Poliwhirl's Ice Beam and a Smoke Bomb, they manage to escape. Well, escape for now at least, because Lieutenant Surge has Magnemites flying all over around the ship looking for Red, leaving gaps in their formation to purposefully lead him towards a trap, which awaits him on the ship's deck. And once there, a Magneton appears using Super Sonic, causing Red to fling Poliwhirl by accident, allowing Surge to catch the Pokemon and throw it overboard. Red then gets trapped inside a magnetic field by Magneton, and Surge gets Electabuzz to finish the job using Thunderbolt, then dropping him into the ocean to be fish food. As Red sinks into the bottom of the ocean, he recalls something similar happening to him when he was a little kid, 
And at that time, Poliwag evolved into Poliwhirl to save him. And in a great twist of fate, the same thing happens again. This time, however, with Poliwhirl evolving into Poliwrath. Surge tries to fight it, but Poliwrath is way too strong now and easily overpowers the Electabuzz, sending it flying towards Surge and forcing the two overboard. And so, although Surge got away, his crew were arrested and the Pokemon that was stolen were freed. And due to Red's heroics, the chairman rewards him with a bike, which allows us to segue into Red's next adventure, a bike race that's taking place in Route 11 and 12. With the prize of money on the line, Red decides to take part in the race. Although, things aren't going too well for him, as his bike kinda sucks. But after witnessing another competitor's idea, he realizes that he can use his Pokemon to help him, with Poliwrath making an ice bridge so that it can go faster, Pikachu shocking all the bugs in the forest, and Bulbasaur kying open a path for them with Razor Leaf. And everything's going well, until a Beedrill hive falls on Bulbasaur's head, making a horde of Beedrill appear and sting them. However, that's just a small price to pay for the distance they made. Red is currently in third, but manages to catch up with the second and third place riders, after seeing them stop by a Snorlax blocking their path. Red tries to fight it, but Snorlax's rest heals any damage done. The only thing to make Snorlax move is food, and the only food Red has is the honey left on Bulbasaur's head, offering Bulbasaur as a snack to entice the Snorlax into waking up, which actually works, causing the Pokemon to chase them all the way to the finish line. But everything worked out in the end, as Red won the race and caught Snorlax, which he nicknamed Snor. Red now heads north of Route 12 and reaches Lavender Town, where it's chucking it down with rain. And to make matters worse, the people there are even less than friendly. All but one, being an old man named Mr. Fuji, who's paying respects to his late dojuo. Mr. Fuji invites Red to his house and explains to Red that Lavender Town Cemetery is called the Pokemon Tower and recently has become under attack by ghosts who have been scaring people and making them unable to put their Pokemon to rest. Mr. Fuji shows Red some photos of his dojuo and in one of the photos is Blue. Mr. Fuji tells Red that Blue came to the town just before dojuo passed and headed to the Pokemon Tower in order to stop the ghosts but that was two weeks ago and he hasn't returned since. Red knows it's unlike Blue to go down easily, meaning the rumors of a tower having a serious ghost problem could be true, and the only way for him to solve it is to tackle it head on. Inside the tower, the fog is everywhere and Pokemon begin to surround Red, rushing up to him and revealing themselves to be Pokemon corpses. Red tries to fight them, but his attacks have no effect. So he and Bulbasaur flee out the fog and realize that the Pokemon are no longer chasing them, meaning what he needs to do is attack the fog rather than the zombies. But before he can execute his plan, a fireball gets shot at him and from inside his fog appears Blue, who's been possessed and begins attacking Red. Whilst Red's trying to fight back, a ghastly reveals itself, being the one in control of the fog, and Red deals with it by having Bulbasaur suck in the fog with Solar Beam, firing it out of the tower and freeing Blue from its control. Blue reluctantly thanks Red for his assistance, but now it's his turn to deal with things. As he reveals, Ghastly wasn't the only person in control of his tower scheme, instead a person was there too. So the two of them head up the tower where they get attacked by an Arbok and his trainer. Being member of Team Rocket's elite triad, the ninja Koga, and the same guy Red saw at Mount Moon. However, Koga is only here as a projection, with his actual body being outside the tower. Koga's Arbok begins to attack Red and Blue, forcing them to retreat back to where the zombie Pokemon were. Which actually turns out to be part of Blue's plan, using a dead Pokemon as a meat shield to take down the Arbok. So with Koga's Pokemon being defeated, the Pokemon Tower is now free and Red and Blue can continue on their journeys. Or should I say, adventures. Red continues to train up his team and eventually Bulbasaur evolves into Ivysaur. A girl then appears and congratulates Red on his achievement as well as to advertise her Pokemon item business, swindling him with her looks and personality into buying worthless gear. After getting scammed, Red takes a trip to the Pokemon Center and decides to call Professor Oak, showcasing the Professor his new Ivysaur making the professor bring up Squirtle, the third Pokemon he had been researching, but unfortunately, Squirtle got stolen. Red leaves the Pokemon Center and by coincidence, runs into the girl from before, rushing over to her and demanding a refund. The girl tries to flee using her war turtle to sail across the river, but Red uses Snorlax to block her path. She tries to trick Red again, but this time he's used to her tactics and gets Snorlax to take her out with Mega Punch. With the girl unconscious, Red takes his money back from her wallet, finding out her name is Green, and theorizing that she may be the one who scores Squirtle due to her having a war turtle. Later at night, Red checks his jacket, only to see his badges are now missing. The next day, Red looks around Celadon City in hopes of finding them and realizing Green must have stolen them. Just then, two Team Rocket grunts walk by, talking about how they're searching for Green as well. So Red decides to ambush one of them and sneak into Team Rocket's base at the game corner. Inside, Red sees a bunch of scientists surrounding a weird looking Pokemon inside a tube. He then overhears their conversation on how they're lacking the cells from Mew to finish off the Pokemon's body, and the cell data they need just so happens to be with Green, who stole it from them. 
A monitor then suddenly starts to beep, informing all the members that Green has been spotted. So they all, Red included, head for her location, managing to get her surrounded. Green tries to fight back, but struggles when she gets pushed to a ledge by Tauros, forcing Red to dive in and save her. Green then sends out her Ditto to confuse all the Pokemon and give her and Red the chance to escape. Once the two escape, Green explains to Red her plans of wanting to catch Mew, showing him the Pokemon using Ditto's transforming ability. Red then recognizes it as the phantom Pokemon that he saw at Pallet Town. Green then takes out a machine that she calls the Mewview in order to search for Mew's psychic patterns. While searching, Red tells Green about what he saw inside Team Rocket's base, wanting to know her reasons for trying to find Mew, and Green says it's money, since she's the ultimate hustle queen. Suddenly, a whirlwind surrounds the two as Mew appears. Red and Green do their best to catch it, but Team Rocket appear and get in their way. Red sends out Poliwrath to protect Mew, but it gets frozen by Jinx. However, this wasn't all for nothing, as Mew recognizes Red's act of kindness and counterattacks using an even stronger blizzard to freeze Team Rocket, then escapes as fast as it appeared. Although they didn't manage to catch Mew, Green managed to get some photos of it, so it's time for her to make her exit, but not before returning Red his badges. Now we take a detour, cutting away from Red for the first time and going over to Blue, who's recently racked up enough points at the game corner to buy a Pokemon. The man working there tells Blue that Pokemon that you buy are much harder to train than Pokemon that you've caught yourself. We then go back to Red, who's trying to leave Celadon City, but before he can, he bumps into Blue, mixing up the two's Pokemon without them realizing it. And after some shenanigans, Red tries to befriend Blue's Pokemon, but to no luck. After a while, Blue's Pokemon start training themselves, impressing Red at their discipline. Three days go by and the Pokemon still don't listen to Red, but they're not being as aggressive either. As for Blue on the other hand, he's training Red's Pokemon harder than they've ever been trained before. As Red's roaming the outskirts of Celadon, he runs into a Ninetales who's fighting against Blue. The Ninetales then suddenly rushes at Red, who counters by sending out Machoke. Red and Blue then start to argue about how they're treating each other's Pokemon, but suddenly, Machoke begins to evolve into Machamp, allowing both trainers to throw a Pokeball and catch the Ninetales. Although technically Red's Pokeball caught the Pokemon, Blue claims the Pokemon is his as he did all the hard work, and the two trade back their Pokemon, with Red now noticing how his Pokemon all have a scary look on their face due to training with Blue. Now Red makes his way down the cycling road, before he runs into a Tangler who jumps in front of him, causing him to fall off his bike. Red tries to chase the Pokemon down, but he gets stopped by the townspeople who tell Red that Lady Erica is inside the building Tangler run into. Erica herself then steps out of the building, apologizing to Red for her Tangler's actions. One of the townspeople mentioned that Erica's a gym leader, so Red decides to challenge her to a battle, and she accepts, but only under the condition that Red finds and catches an Eevee. Since finding Eevee is not a simple task, Red goes to a Pokemon Center and hopes to contact Professor Oak, but he's out. However, there's someone else who can help him, and that's Bill, who comes down to Route 17 in order to help Red find the Pokemon. Bill contacts some friends who give them info, and eventually they find a lead that there's been an Eevee going around Celadon City breathing fire. Bill takes out a machine that can sense a Pokemon by its type and picks up on something. Red gets his Krabby out ready to fight back the fire breathing Eevee, but the Eevee appears and evolves into Jolteon, taking down Krabby. So Red decides to swap into Diglett, but Eevee evolves once again into Vaporeon, taking Diglett down as well. Red swaps one more time, this time into Ivysaur, but once again the Eevee evolves, now into Flareon. Bill figures out that this Eevee can evolve into its evolutions, then refer back to normal. And it can detect which Pokemon to evolve into by swiveling around its ears. So Red comes up with a plan, using Ivysaur's Razor Leaf to cover the Pokemon's ears, stopping it from evolving, then attacking with Solar Beam. Eevee goes down, but then starts to writhe in pain. Bill tells Red that Eevee can't have been born with these powers. Instead, someone must have experimented on it evident by the chip on its ear. Red picks up the Eevee and heads straight for the Celadon gym, as after all, Eric is the one who sent him on this quest. Inside the gym, Red and Bill find a book that talks about Eevee reconstruction, and then right on cue, Erica appears. She congratulates Red on completing his mission and now accepts to do battle with him. Red explodes at Erica for experimenting on Eevee and then using him to clean up her dirty work. Erica sends out three of her Pokemon and Red does the same, but his team gets overpowered with ease, leaving only Pikachu left to fight. Erica taunts Red, saying that he has potential and that he should try rematch her once he's gotten stronger. Red then notices Eevee struggling inside of his Pokeball, and Erica walks over to it, saying that she should put it out of its misery. However, Red isn't going to let this just happen, with Pikachu learning Substitute to escape the Petal Dance and stop Erica from ending Eevee. Erica then begins to laugh, impressed by Red and Pikachu's willingness to sacrifice their health in order to defend Eevee. She then uses a machine to heal Eevee back to full health, telling them that now Eevee should have no problems. Red and Bill are confused by her switch in personality and she apologized saying that it was just a facade to test Red as a trainer. 
with the real truth being that Evie was experimented on by an organization Red knows all too well, being Team Rocket. Although he didn't win the gym battle, Erica gives Red her gym badge and tells him that her and Celadon City will be fighting alongside him in the battle against Team Rocket. And after a few days, Red gets ready to leave Celadon City, now with a new team member by his side, V the Eevee. And that's where I got my channel name from, if it wasn't obvious enough. Now Red arrives in Fuchsia City and takes part in the Safari Zone experience, but he gets in trouble when he tries to catch some Pokemon with Pokeballs rather than using the Safari Zone given Safari Balls. With the Pokeball accidentally catching a Nidoqueen that two Nidoking were fighting over, causing them to chase after him. Because of this, Red ends up having to survive in the Safari Zone without the use of his Pokemon, instead using his own brains, having to fight against Nidoking and a whole horde of Bellsprout, Weeping Bell and Victory Bell. But with some clever thinking, as well as the help from Pidgeybot, Red manages to catch the majority of the Pokemon in the Safari Zone. After that traumatic experience, Red makes a big detour, going through Diglett's cave, where he, along with a man he met, was searching for fossils. Red can't shake the feeling that he's met the man before, but the man denies this. As they approach Pewter City, they see that the city's museum is on fire due to some magma. So Red uses his Pokemon to trap the magma and prevent them from causing more trouble. The man is impressed by Red's actions and gives him an old amber as a parting gift. Once Red leaves, the magma break out, allowing the man to send out his own Pokemon, Cloyster, to finish the job, revealing himself to be a member of Team Rocket, and he's actually been scouting Red this whole time. Next, Red heads for Route 19 in order to search for the Hidden Machine Surf, learning from Professor Oak about the five Hidden Machines. So far, he's managed to collect three of them, being Flash, Cart and Strength, and now all he needs is Surf and Fly. Pretty cool for them to actually treat HMs as if they're actual Hidden Machines. Because Red wants to go to the Seafoam Islands, he'll need to prioritize getting Surf, which he manages to locate being under the sea. However, things won't be easy as a Dragonite is blocking his path. Red tries to get the Dragonite out of his way, but his plan ends up failing and Dragonite destroys the HM, and Red's leg getting trapped underneath some rocks, making him unable to escape. As Red begins to drown, for the second time, he sees a Gyarados and a Mermaid coming to his rescue. Now on the surface, thanks to the help of Starmie, Red regains consciousness, quickly understanding the situation and commanding Gyarados to use Hyper Beam, taking down the Dragonite. Out of the water jumps Misty, telling Red that if he needed help crossing the sea, he should have just come to her for help. Red then gets some lessons on how to ride Gyarados, and eventually they both reach the Seed Foam Islands. Misty gifts Red her Gyarados in return for his Krabby, and leaves wishing him luck. On the island, Red takes a chance to introduce to his team their newest teammate, Gyro the Gyarados, telling them that their new mission will be searching for the legendary Pokemon Articuno, who roams the Sea Foam Islands. Red's Pokemon are very timid of Gyarados, remembering its aggressive nature from before. But that's the least of their worries, as Red gets attacked by a Muck, and Gyarados swoops in to save him. Red tries to get everyone to help Gyarados, but they're still conflicted. It turns out though that this muck has an owner, being Team Rocket, who have forced Articuno to seal itself in ice as a defense mechanism. Muck begins to attack the Articuno and Red asks Gyarados to stop it, but Gyarados is having a relapse after seeing Team Rocket. Muck then switches targets and attacks Gyarados again, and Articuno breaks out of its ice in order to escape. Team Rocket chases after it, and Red's Pokemon are about to follow, but Red tells him to stop and instead focus on helping Gyarados. With Eevee being the first to step up, understanding Gyarados' pain, and eventually everyone else joins in, attacking the Muck and saving Gyarados. However, Muck isn't finished yet and tries to attack again, but surprisingly, Articuno steps in, freezing the Pokemon and helping out Red, before flying away again to make its escape. With Articuno fleeing, Red has no choice but to move on to the next island, which is Cinnabar Island. As he approaches the island, he sees a fire by the cliffside, and when he goes to take a look, he runs into Team Rocket again, this time attacking a two fire Pokemon. Because of the intense heat, Red ends up revealing his hiding spot and Team Rocket tried to attack him. But he's saved when a man named Blaine appears, claiming that Team Rocket is after him so they should let Red go. However, Red is no slouch himself, repaying the favor by getting Gyarados to attack Team Rocket, allowing Blaine the chance to get his Rapidash and grab Red and escape into the forest. Whilst they're riding, Blaine explains to Red that he was once a member of Team Rocket, working as a scientist, but he's left them now. Their conversation gets cut short though, as Team Rocket reveal their secret weapon, the legendary Pokemon Moltres. Blaine asks Red if he has a flying Pokemon, which Red doesn't. As they're dodging fireballs, Red's old Amber falls out of his pocket and Blaine notices it, telling Red to head back to his lab so he can revert the old Amber into a Pokemon. Once there, with the help of Rapidash, Red puts the fossil into a machine, breaking the old Amber and releasing an Aerodactyl. Aerodactyl picks up Red and flies him over to the battle and despite being newly hatched, it pushes back Moltres and forces Team Rocket into retreating. 
Blaine thanks Red for his help, but now it's time for him to leave, as he has to chase down the bioweapon that he created to make sure it doesn't harm anyone. But before he goes, he makes sure to give Red his gym badge. Now we go to Saffron City's Silphco, where we see a girl who's part of Team Rocket speaking with Koga, who successfully managed to catch Articuno. He mocks her for her team's failure with even Moltres by her side, when suddenly Lieutenant Surge appears on the monitor, giving a message that he's caught Zapdos. And we then see the man who was with Red earlier, who talks about the failure of Project Mewtwo and how they have a new plan, utilizing the legendary birds. We now cut again to Blue, who's been trying to get to Saffron City, but all four roads to it have been blocked, forcing him to try fly in with Charizard. In the sky, he encounters Green, who tries to warn him about the barrier around the city, but she was a little too late. Blue tries to use Charizard's flames, but that doesn't work either, and Green asks Blue if he would like to team up, but he doesn't reply, instead making his way for Pallet Town in order to ask his grandpa for help. From Cinnabar Island, Red now heads for Pallet Town in order to visit the professor, but when he arrives, he notices that nobody's around. Inside the lab, he sees the professor and asks him what's going on, only for the professor to attack him. Red gets Ivysaur to restrain the professor, but he starts using psychic powers, making him realize this must be a Pokemon instead of the professor. Ivysaur uses Leech Seed on the Pokemon, making it reveal itself to be Kadabra. Then suddenly, a voice starts to speak to Red, this voice belonging to Sabrina, the third and final member of Team Rocket's Elite Triad. She tells Red that Professor Oak and the people of Pallet Town have been kidnapped and taken to Saffron City, telling him if he wants to save them, he knows where to go, and makes her leave with Teleport. Blue then appears with Charizard and shows Red a photo he took from above Saffron City, showcasing Team Rocket's there. The two discuss what could happen and conclude that the final battle between good and evil is about to begin. Red also notices that his Eevee that he sent to Professor Oak is missing because of Team Rocket's interference, but Blue's Pokemon are still safe. Blue then tells Red that he thinks Team Rocket attacked Pallet Town because of him interfering with their plans all the time. And like usual, Red goes to throw hands. And also like usual, Blue catches his fist and tells him to stay out of this as he'll be dealing with Team Rocket from now on. Blue also tells Red that Professor Oak built his lab here for the very same reason that he and Red ran into Mew when they first met. And that reason is that Pallet Town is the one place where Pokemon aren't threatened by pollution, like in the other cities. And it was meant to stay that way, until Team Rocket came. And Blue won't stand for that, taking flight and heading to Saffron City. And of course, Red follows, believing the very same. Once at the city, Green from up above watches the boys as they struggle. Red then comes up with a plan of using Pikachu Substitute to enter past the barrier. But once inside, it has no idea how to find the enemy. And it just so happens that Blue's Golduck knows how to find the enemy, but can't pass through the barrier. So with a nudge in the right direction from Green, the gang work together to have Pikachu's energy clone find the Mr. Mime creating the barrier and defeat it. Once the Mr. Mime goes down, everyone can now enter the barrier, with Red and Blue heading straight for the Silphco building. Once they get inside, the floor underneath Red's feet drops, separating him from Blue. Although Blue wants to help Red, he's stopped when Koga appears. Blue tries to fight Koga, but Koga's using his Pokemon as armor and has his muck restrained Blue from moving. Down below, Red finds himself inside a ring where the walls are electrified and Voltorbs and Electrodes are being shot at him. This being the cruel work of Lieutenant Surge, who's returned. Surge is taking no prisoners and shocks Red continuously with his new electric immune gear, supplied to him by Team Rocket. Red wonders why Surge's Pokemon aren't getting weaker when he reveals that his Pokemon are being charged by Zapdos. As for Blue, he sees what's happening to Red through Koga's Golbat, and Koga tells Blue that he's going to be used as a hostage so that they can force Professor Oak to work on their experiment, as their previous scientist ran away, which we know is now Blaine. Blue tries to fight back but seemingly gets killed by Koga's Golbat's Razor Wind. Also inside Silphco is Green, who's now making her way through the floors without being noticed until she runs into a room that looks like outside. Suddenly, Sabrina appears and tells Green that she's using her psychic powers to bring out Green's deepest fears. Green, however, manages to hold Sabrina off with her horsey smokescreen, making the psychic trainer unable to see her surroundings. Back on the first floor, Red's still getting tortured by Lieutenant Surge, but he comes up with a plan, using Ivysaur's razor leaf to cut the wires and clothing protecting Surge, making him no longer immune to Zapdos' lightning and letting him get shocked in the process, knocking him out. Red takes the Thunder Badge from Surge as well as his electric immune gloves, thinking they may come in handy later. He then hurries up the stairs to help out Blue, but he's already been taken down. Red does his best to fight Koga, but easily gets caught by Mark just like Blue did, and Koga goes to finish off Blue. But at the last moment, he's directly hit by Blue's Pidgeot, and Blue reveals that he survived the attack thanks to the pendant he received from his grandfather. Now on the back foot, Koga brings out his secret weapon, Articuno, and tries to freeze both Red and Blue to death. And Blue realizes 
that Koga didn't catch Articuno, instead it's using the Soul Badge to control and boost Articuno's powers. And Koga says he's not only using the Soul Badge, but also the other badges held by the Triad and their leader. Red and Blue begin to get completely frozen over, but they manage to break out with Charizard, who was outside of the building, setting it aflame. Red and Blue then finish Koga off and take his badge for themselves. The duo then have to split ways, in order for Blue to help out Professor Oak, and for Red to go help out Green, who's currently under attack by Sabrina, who doesn't need to see with her eyes, instead using her psychic powers to direct her. After some struggling, Green uses her Clefairy and Jigglypuff to confuse Sabrina with Growl and Sing, allowing her to flee. On her way out though, she manages to grab the Marsh Badge. Now we go back to Red, who's running up the floors, and suddenly finds a room holding an item called the Badge Energy Amplifier, which is a bit of a mouthful. Sabrina then walks into the room Red's hiding in, and Red realizes that the indentations on the machine make up the seven gym badges, and he only needs one more to fill every slot. Sabrina then notices Red, and he sends out Pikachu to do battle, but Pikachu doesn't attack, noticing that Sabrina is actually green in disguise. Down in the basement, Blue finds his grandfather and rescues him, and Oak tells him that the people from Pallet Town are being held in the floor just under them, and they need to go save them now. Green and Red discuss making a trade, as Green just so happens to have the Marsh Badge, and Red just so happens to have the Moonstone, an item Green really wants. So the two trade. Because she's such a nice friend, Green tells Red to be careful, as the machine will amplify a Pokemon's power big time. Or at least, that's what she tells Red. But in actuality, the machine creates a whole new Pokemon, and that's the reason why she's here in the first place. Just then, the real Sabrina appears, and Red tries to use the Badge Amplifier to boost Pikachu's power, but nothing happens as Green forgot to say that she never actually returned Red's badges, instead gave him fakes. And now she takes the machine and the real badges and makes a run for it, leaving Red to fight against Sabrina, as well as the three legendary birds under her control. Around the corner, Green puts in the real badges and out comes a light, which flies up and then heads back to the direction Red was. Outside the building, Team Rocket's grunts are all trying to escape, but they're stopped by Brock, Misty and Erica, as well as the people in Celadon City, who have arrived just in time to help Red and Blue. Back inside, the flying lights hits the legendary birds, fusing them into one legendary monster. When Green enters the room, she faints at the sight of the creature, meaning Red's just gonna have to fight alone. Sabrina then throws Red his Eevee, saying that they stole the Pokemon and revealing it to be the prototype of this experiment they had been planning. As the fight heats up, Red's Ivysaur ends up getting flung outside the hole in the wall, and things are starting to look really bad for Red. But luckily, Blue appears in order to lend Red a hand. However, against the legendary beast, they don't stand much chance. Red then remembers that Green wanted the Moonstone from him, and it must have been for a reason, picking up the stone and holding it to the moon, making Green's Clefairy get out of its Pokeball and evolve into Clefable. The Clefable uses Metronome to fight against the legendary bird, and holds it back for quite a while. But Sabrina won't give up easily, using the Pokemon to send the gang flying out of the building. Things look over for the team, but they're saved by Red's Ivysaur's fine web. Green then wakes up and sends her Blastoise out, whilst Blue uses Charizard and Red using Ivysaur and the three of them command their Pokemon to attack at full power, with Red's Ivysaur even evolving into Venusaur. The power of the starters together is enough to land a hit on the legendary bird, splitting them back into three and knocking Sabrina away, thus freeing the Pokemon. So with Team Rocket's main force defeated, the trio run away from the collapsing building, but as Red leaves, he sees a man staring at him from behind the building. With the heroes victorious, Red and Blue meet up with their friends, gym leaders and Professor Oak, and Red wonders where Green ran off to with her hiding behind a tree now that Professor Oak is in sight. Blue then tells Red that he looks forward to fighting against him in the Indigo Plateau, finally accepting him as a proper rival and equal. A while later, we see a flashback of Team Rocket's lab, where Mewtwo has broken out and escaped, causing massive damage. This flashback is actually a dream though, belonging to Blaine, whose arm twitches now that he's arrived at his location, Cerulean City. Also in Cerulean City is Red, who's come there after hearing about the Beast of Cerulean from Bill. Although we want not to go there, Red still persists, and he and his team walk around until they find a cave, but Red's Pokemon are all too afraid to go inside of it. Suddenly, a tornado forms inside the cave, picking up Red and his Pokemon. Red tries to get his Pokemon to hold onto each other and escape, but his Pokeballs have all been blown away. They all try to fly out, but Aerodactyl can't hold everyone, so they all begin to fall, and as Red falls into the Twister, he's held by an unknown figure who gives him Pokeballs to catch and save his team with. This person of course being Blaine. Red and Blaine discuss the monster, and Blaine explains how the Twister works, with him describing it as both an unbeatable offense and defense, and it's called the Psy Wave. The monster then reveals itself from the center of the attack, being Mewtwo, and it tries to suck both Red and Blaine towards it. Suddenly, Mewtwo begins to vanish, but Blaine can sense where it is, due to his arm suffering from a mutation. Remember earlier how Green stole Mew's data? Yeah, 
Well, they didn't have enough Mew data to finish off Mew 2. So instead, Blaine used his own DNA to complete the creation of Mew 2, thus linking him and the Pokemon. And it's the main reason why he can't just let it run wild. Blaine then traps Red in a fireball, telling him he can't get dragged into this mess, heading straight into the vortex to confront Mew 2. And after a massive crash, the Twister vanishes. Blaine hits the ground, but he's still barely clinging onto life. He then reveals to Red that he actually had a Master Ball, but he never had the chance to use it as Mewtwo kept making tornadoes. Blaine then tells Red that the reason why he left Team Rocket was actually because of him, as he's seen the righteous acts that he made against Team Rocket's evil ways, and it made him want to change too. He then falls unconscious, and things go from bad to worse, as Red's hat gets flung off by Mewtwo, who's still alive. With Blaine knocked out, Red's the only one who can still fight, and so he tries, but Mewtwo creates a spoon out of psychic energy. Blaine then starts to wake up and informs Red that this spoon may look like a joke, but in truth, it's actually the ultimate weapon for a psychic Pokemon. He tells Red that there's no way to catch Mewtwo, and the only way to stop it is to destroy it. So, Red decides to go for a risky move, sending out his entire team, which makes Mewtwo start up another tornado attack. This time, however, Red lets his Pokemon get caught in the tornado, whilst he, Aero, and Pikachu fly towards the center, trying to attack the Pokemon before it can get its tornado to full power. But even this plan fails as Mewtwo pushes them all back. But as his last ditch effort attempt, he throws Pikachu towards Mewtwo, who's holding a Master Ball in its mouth, hitting Mewtwo and successfully capturing the Pokemon. With Mewtwo captured, Red gives Blaine the Master Ball and tells him that although Mewtwo was super scary and was created to be a weapon, it hasn't had the chance to live its life as a Pokemon, meaning all it needs is for someone to guide it and show him that the world isn't all just bleak and grey. Blaine thinks to himself that Red represents everything a true Pokemon trainer should be, and tells Red that he would love to bow him one day, with Red accepting. But for now, it's time for the Indigo League. We now go to the Viridian Forest, where we see a little girl who's roaming around lost. The girl then gets attacked by a Dratini, but Red swoops in and saves her. He tells the girl that she should be more careful, and the girl thanks him and asks about his Pokemon. So, Red decides to teach her about Pokemon and help her catch one for herself, with the girl catching a Rattata. Suddenly though, a bunch of savage Pokemon appear and prepare to attack them, but Red uses Aerodactyl to get them to safety, and the two head to Viridian City, where the girl lives. In the city, the people scold the girl, as they said to stay out of the forest due to the weird things going on, and Red wonders what they mean. Red also tells the people who he is, and why he's here, and that's to find stronger trainers to battle before the Indigo League. But the people tell him that there's no one in town who could give him a decent match, as the city's gym's been closed for a really long time with no one really knowing who the gym leader was, but from the rumors that go around, all they know is that he was invincible. Red then prepares to head for the gym, but he tells the girl that although Pokemon can look scary, deep down they're actually just kind, loving creatures, and if you raise them right, they'll always be your friend. At the gym, Red and Saw go inside, only to find a bus statue that's been broken down. Red finds the face of a statue familiar, but can't recall where he's seen it before. When suddenly, a light flashes, and a man steps out of the shadows, telling Red that he's been expecting him, like a typical villain would. And that's because he is a typical villain, with the man revealing himself to be Giovanni, the fossil man that Red met before, as well as the leader of Team Rocket and this gym. Red starts to back up and have his team ready to fight, knowing he can't afford to make any mistakes against his opponent, trying to figure out what he should do. Giovanni, however, answers all of Red's suspicions, being that the two of them are the only ones here, and he doesn't have to worry about getting attacked first, as he drops all of his Pokeballs onto the floor, telling Red to bring everything he can, since now he has the advantage. Red falls for this taunt and goes on the offensive, but Giovanni has way more experience, telling Red that he took way too long to pick up and throw a Pokeball, and in that time, he was able to counterattack. Giovanni then makes a proposal for Red to join Team Rocket, which of course he rejects, but Giovanni proposes a bet. If Red manages to defeat him, he won't continue to pressure him and accept his decision, but if he wins, then Red has to become a loyal servant for Team Rocket. Red once again falls for this taunt, but also chooses to drop his Pokeballs on the floor, in order for them to have a fair fight. So the two trainers begin their battle. Red reaches his Pokeballs first and fights with Snorlax, who does its best but gets taken down by Golem's explosion. And before Red can even fight back, he's being held at needle point by Beedrill. Red slowly starts to back up, which is actually part of his plan, rolling a Pokeball under his foot to let out Aerodactyl. The Rock type is able to defeat the Bug type, but Giovanni uses a hole in the floor to escape and cause an earthquake causing Red to get hit by a rock whilst trying to save Poliwrath. Red barely makes it outside of the gym, but all that awaits him outside is Giovanni's full team, who beat him and his Pokemon down. Giovanni's Dug Trio then hits two of Red's Pokeballs, sending them flying and breaking the mechanism, trapping the Pokemon inside, which is genuinely really scary if you think about it. Giovanni then begins his evil villain monologue, 
telling Red that he's taken control of every area Red's been to, such as the SS Anne in Saffron City, and now even Viridian Forest, where the Pokemon are going savage all thanks to him. As him and his group of scientists have been experimenting on the Pokemon, trying to create the ultimate army, and the only one who knows of his evil plans is Red, and he is the only one who can stop him. Pikachu then jumps inside his Pokeball into Red's hand, allowing Red to think of a plan. Rushing at Giovanni who knows everything Red will do, such as having Pikachu leave its Pokeball and charge a Thunderbolt. But because he knows this, he'll finish the job of Nida King's Poison Sting. As Red throws Pikachu's Pokeball, it enters the field, just like Giovanni predicted, but it's already charged its attack, allowing it to strike with Thunderbolt, powerful enough to even take down Giovanni's ground types. I wouldn't advise trying this in the games though. Red explains that he let Pikachu charge its energy inside of its Pokeball. Usually this would be impossible as the voltage would be in the thousands, but because of a glove he got from Lieutenant Surge, he can hold it with no problems, thus granting Red the victory and defeating Giovanni. However, he faints soon after due to his injuries. When he wakes up, he's back in Viridian City, thanks to the girl from before and the people who managed to calm down the Pokemon of the forest. As after meeting Red the first time, they felt inspired by his heroics. The girl then asks Red if he would be willing to teach everyone in the city about Pokemon, which Red accepts, which Red accepts, saying that after he's achieved enough, he'll come back to the city and become the best gym leader ever. Now with Team Rocket defeated, our final stop is the Indigo League, which is filled with tons of people running around trying to enter and spectate. The Pokemon fan club's president is among these people and finds a spirit waddling around. The owner of the Pokemon then appears, being a muscular man wrapped in black tape. He goes up to the desk and asks to enter the tournament, seeing on the desk that Red, Blue and even Green have entered as well. Inside the building, Red's already qualified as the winner of Group C, placing him in the semi-finals. Another challenger who's qualified is Blue, the winner of Group D. Red and Blue have some rival talk about how Pallet Town has always been the winner of the Pokemon League, but this time the question is who of Pallet Town will be the winner? Will it be him or Red? Blue tells his rival he looks forward to their battle in the final round, then goes on his way. Red then notices that Green is also here, trying to swindle a trade with a fisherman. But not only that, she's also qualified herself as the winner of Group A, and she plans on winning this tournament as a resident of Pallet Town too. Which catches Red by surprise, but before you can ask any more questions, Bill arrives. Bill showcases Red the matchups, with the semi-finals having Red and Blue battling out already, upsetting Red as he wanted to fight his rival in the finals. But before their semi-final match, we have the other semi-final match, which is Green fighting against a man called Dr. O, or the guy we saw earlier. Their battle begins with Green using Jigglypuff and Dr. O using his Spearow. The audience begin to underestimate Green for using a cute Pokemon, but Red knows it's probably part of her strategy. Green attacks Dr. O, but the Spearow is way stronger than she thought, tanking the attack and retaliating against Green. She tries to use Sing, but Spearow is too fast to be affected by the attack. So Red tells Green to use a flying type Pokemon to fight back, but Green says she doesn't have any flying types, which right on cue prompts Dr. O to show off his team, being a team filled with flying type Pokemon. He then sneaks up behind Green and tells her this is a lesson that stealing is wrong. Green, although on the back foot, takes this opportunity to use Disabled on the man and reveal her new weapon being Blastoise's ability to fly with its water cannon. The spray from the hydro pump starts to make Dr. O's mask fall off, so he commands his spirit to use Mirror Move, bringing Blastoise and Green down to the ground. Spirit approaches Green and she suddenly freaks out, so Dr. O asks, does she have a phobia of bird Pokemon? He then tells a story of a girl from 6 years ago. The girl was 5 years old and was abducted by a large legendary bird Pokemon. At the time, Dr. O had a grandson at the same age, so he got deeply involved in the investigation, trying his best to help. Because of his time spent on the case, he deeply recognizes the girl's face. So he was super surprised when one day, his security camera caught a girl with the same face appearing at his lab and stealing a Squirtle. With his mask finally falling off of his face and revealing himself to be Professor Oak. Green tries one more last ditch attack, but it fails and she officially loses the battle. Oak then asks Green, why did she steal his Pokemon? And Green explains her side of the story, with her being kidnapped and having to grow up in a place she didn't know, whilst boys her age from Pallet Town were able to start their journeys and get Pokedexes from the great Professor Oak. But she had to miss out, even though she was from Pallet Town too. She wanted to be able to do what the other children were doing and start a journey with a Pokedex. Professor Oak then tells Green to remember what he said, stealing is wrong and he wants her to promise that she won't do it again, gifting her with the third Pokedex. And Green promises, bursting out into tears, with Professor Oak comforting her. I'm trying to only include the important stuff, but I just want to quickly bring up this panel of Bill. It's not important, but I thought it was funny. Later on in the waiting rooms, Blue speaks with his grandfather on how in the finals, he's either going to be against him or Red. But Oak tells him in his youth he already won a championship, meaning he's going to retire here and let our two favourite rivals duel it out in the finals. 
meaning now it's time for the final match to determine the champion and winner of the Indigo League. So let's get started. Red and Blue throw out their Pokeballs beginning the battle, with them both choosing their starter Pokemon. Although he's at disadvantage, Red pushes through using Poison Power and Razor Leaf to force Blue on the back foot, then quickly changing into Snorlax, but Blue also swaps going for Hitmonchamp. Red tries to stall with Harden, but Blue catapults Snorlax into the sky with a piece of the broken stage. Because Snorlax has gone so high, everyone thinks it's out of bounds and unable to battle. Oak is proud of his grandson for changing his arrogant ways and learning to adapt to more surprising situations, becoming more like Red in a way. However, this fight isn't over, with Snorlax coming down from the sky with Double Edge and landing on Machamp, taking it down. Professor Oak is also proud of Red for learning to keep his cool in situations and using biological knowledge of Pokemon along with his battle instinct, resulting in him becoming more like Blue. Blue thanks his Machamp, knowing that Machamp has been hit by Toxic, which caused his health to drop so rapidly. And Red realizes how much Blue's grown, as before, he didn't even notice the baby Kangaskhan was sick. Blue then chooses Ninetales and Red is about to fight back with Snorlax but he chooses to let it rest instead as now he's much more well aware of Blue's advice that he gave when they first met. With the two trainers both learning from each other to improve their strengths, the battle is reaching its climax. Watching this battle from the sidelines are four shadowy figures who make their thoughts on the intense battle. Back with the battle, Red is using Poliwrath to fight against Ninetales but despite the fact it has type advantage, it gets sent airborne and KO'd by Fire Blast, spraying water everywhere. Red then decides to go for Pikachu, but the same thing happens again. Blue then decides to swap for his ace Charizard and Red swaps for Venusaur. Everyone's shocked at Red's choice, but Red has a plan. Tying Charizard up with Vine Whip, Blue tells Red that such a simple plan won't work, but suddenly clouds start to form above them. Red tells Blue that this is his final play by having Poliwrath's water get heated up by Ninetales, causing a cloud to form. And now that cloud is charged with electricity due to Pikachu getting sent flying to the sky. And now with Vine Whip, he can create a lightning rod, which directly strikes on Charizard. A massive explosion of fog occurs and Blue comes out still standing, but him and his Charizard eventually fall, meaning the winner of this battle is Red and his team, although they shortly collapse soon after as well. Later on, the reward ceremony is about to begin, and in the meantime, Green is trying to get sponsors for herself, replacing third by default, much to Bill's dismay. Green then calls out to Red and Blue to hurry up so that they can start the ceremony, and the two trainers give each other a gaze of respect for their final battle. In the distance, Mew watches over everything before quickly zooming away, thus bringing the story to an end. For now anyway, as next time I'll be talking about the sequel of the Yellow Arc. But before we talk about that stuff, tell me, did you enjoy this arc of Pokemon Adventures? There was a lot of great stuff, but also a lot of questionable things too. However, that's part of the charm of the series, as it takes place in the early life of Pokemon, where most of the rules weren't fully established. Whatever your thoughts and opinions are, let me know in the comment section down below and I'll catch you all in the next one. Take care.